Welcome to 2024 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Welcome to lesson number seven, titled Your Mercy Reaches Under the Heavens, ready for teaching on Sabbath, February 17. It's from the Sabbath School Lesson Series on Psalms, authored by Dr. Dragoslava Sandrak and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, February 10. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, We thank you once again for your word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, which reaches unto heaven. And Lord, it's available for each of us, and we so appreciate that. And as we've been studying these psalms, we have just refreshed our knowledge of you. We've refreshed our faith in your word and in you as well. We pray that as we open your word this week, that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. May we know that you are with us each moment of each day. And today I'd like to pray for Frankie Skinner and for Vanessa, the sister of Andrew Nike and Mark and Carol Sutherland in North Carolina and Milamo Hawengo in Zambia and Wendy DeMills in Trinidad and Tobago and Joan Skinner in Snowshoe, West Virginia and Edric Luke and Hazelyn Balliston and Pauline Beckford who has a, a problem with her eyes. Lord, we thank you that we can pray to you at any time and I pray, Lord, that you'll remember each of these people and Fill them with your love and your grace. And today I'd also like to pray for our pastors, Lord, of our various churches and the elders and and our Sabbath school teachers. Lord, we need to remember that the leaders in our church have an important role, an important function, but they're only human and they need your help and your guidance day by day, just as each one of us does. Bless us as we open your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text for this week is Psalm 57, verses 9 and 10. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations, for your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Let's read that again, Psalm 57, verses 9 and 10. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations, for your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. The psalmists realize that they are spiritually poor and have nothing good to offer to God. That is, they have nothing in and of themselves that would recommend them before God's holy throne, as we read in Psalm 40, verse 17. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God." They understand that they, as do all of us, need grace, God's grace. In short, they need the gospel. The Psalms stress the fact that people are fully dependent on God's mercy. Fortunately, God's mercy is everlasting, as evidenced in both God's creation and the history of God's people, as we've read in Psalm 136. Let's read it again. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. O give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. O give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures endures forever. To him who struck Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endures forever, and brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endures forever. With a strong hand and with an outstretched arm, for his mercy endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his mercy endures forever, and made Israel pass through 
the midst of it, for his mercy endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, for his mercy endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his mercy endures forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his mercy endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage, for his mercy endures forever. A heritage to Israel his servant, for his mercy endures forever. Who remembered us in our lowly state, for his mercy endures forever. And rescued us from our enemies, for his mercy endures forever. Who gives food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. Before the everlasting God, human life is as transient as grass. But God pities humans and renews their strength, and in him they have the promise of eternity. We read in Psalm 103 verse 3, Who forgives all your iniquities who heals all your diseases, and verse 5, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And verse 15, and that reads, As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. God's people take comfort in the fact that the Lord is faithful to his covenant, the people's appeals, no matter how pressing at times, are often filled with hope because they are directed to their compassionate Heavenly Father. As we read in Psalm 103 verse 13, As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. And Psalm 68 verse 5, A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. And Psalm 89 verse 26, He shall cry to me, You are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Fresh experiences of God's grace and love strengthen their resolve to worship and serve God and no one or nothing else. Sunday, February 11, His Mercy Endures Forever. Read Psalm 136. What thought predominates in this psalm? Where does the psalmist find evidence for his prevalent claim? Psalm 136, beginning at verse 1. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. To him who struck Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endures forever, and brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endures forever. With a strong hand and with an outstretched arm, for his mercy endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his mercy endures forever, and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, for his mercy endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his mercy endures forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endures forever. 
Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endures forever, and Og, king of Bashan, for his mercy endures forever, and gave their land as a heritage, for his mercy endures forever, a heritage to Israel his servant, for his mercy endures forever, who remembered us in our lowly state for his mercy endures forever, and rescued us from our enemies, for his mercy endures forever, who gives food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. Psalm 136 summons God's people to praise the Lord for his mercy as revealed in creation, as we read in verses 4 to 9, and in Israel's history in verses 10 to 22. Mercy, the Hebrew word kesed, K-H-E-S-E-D, or steadfast love, conveys God's goodness and loyalty to his creation and to his covenant with Israel. The psalm shows that God's immense power and magnificence are grounded in his steadfast love. The Lord is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, which is a Hebrew idiom that means the greatest God, as we read in verses 1 to 3. Let's read that again. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. Not that there are other gods, but that he is the only God. The Lord's great wonders, which cannot be replicated by anyone else, are the undeniable demonstration of his dominion. In verse 4, to him who alone does great wonders. God created the heavens, the earth and the heavenly bodies, which are worshipped by the pagans. As you read in Deuteronomy 4 verse 19, And take heed, lest you lift up your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. The Psalms, however, strip the pagan gods and, by extent, every human-based source of confidence of their authority. They are mere products of the creation. They are merely created things, not the creator. A crucial distinction. The image of the Lord's strong hand and outreaching arm in verse 12 stresses the efficacy of God's power and the far-reaching domain of his mercy. God's mercy in creation and history should inspire his people to trust in him and to remain faithful to his covenant. The refrain, for his mercy endures forever, is repeated 26 times in the Psalms thus assuring the worshippers that the Lord does not change and will repeat his past favours to each new generation. God remembers his people in verse 23 and is faithful to his covenant of grace. The belief in the Lord's enduring mercy is at the core of biblical faith, which includes joyous worship and confidence, as well as reticence and repentance. Psalm 136 closes with God's universal care of the world in verses 23 to 25, who remembered us in our lowly state and rescued us from our enemies, who gives food to all flesh, Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. God's mercy is extended not only to Israel, but to all creation. The psalm thus speaks of the universality of God's saving grace and exhorts the whole world to join Israel's praise of God. And we're going to look at some other verses here, first of all, 
Luke chapter 2 and verse 10, Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Acts 15, verse 17, So that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. And so to finish today, How does the image of Jesus on the cross, dying as a substitute for our sins, most powerfully reveal the great truth about God that His love endures forever? Monday, February 12, Create in me a clean heart. Read Psalm 51, verses 1 to 5. Why does the psalmist appeal to God's mercy? Psalm 51, beginning at verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. King David pours out his heart before the Lord, asking for the forgiveness of sin during the spiritually darkest moments in his life. And we read that story in Second Samuel chapter 12, which I'll read from the God's Word translation. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan came to him and said, There were two men in a certain city. One was rich and the other was poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cows, but the poor man had only one little female lamb that he had bought. He raised her and she grew up in his home with his children. She would eat his food and drink his cup. She rested in his arms and was like a daughter. Now a visitor came to the rich man. The rich man thought it would be a pity to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller, so he took the poor man's lamb and prepared here for the traveller. David burned with anger against the man. I solemnly swear, as the Lord lives, he said to Nathan, the man who did this certainly deserves to die, and he must pay back four times the price of the lamb, because he did this and had no pity. You are the man, Nathan told David. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and rescued you from Saul. I gave you your master Saul's house and his wives. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this wasn't enough, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise my word by doing what I considered evil? You had Uriah the Hittite killed in battle. You took his wife as your wife. You used the Ammonites to kill him. So warfare will never leave your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. This is what the Lord says, I will store up trouble against you within your own household, and before your own eyes I will take your wives and give them to someone close to you. He will go to bed with your wives in broad daylight. You did this secretly, but I will make this happen in broad daylight in front of all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin, you will not die. But since you have shown total contempt for the Lord by this affair, the son that is born to you must die. Then Nathan went home. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had given birth to, for David so that the child became sick. 
David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and lay on the ground all night. The older leaders in his palace stood beside him to raise him up from the ground, but he was unwilling, and he wouldn't eat with them. On the seventh day the child died. But David's officials were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. They thought, while the child was alive, we talked to him and he wouldn't listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may harm himself. But when David saw that his officials were whispering to one another, he realized that the child was dead. Is the child dead? David asked them. Yes, he is dead, they answered. So David got up from the ground, bathed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes. He went into the Lord's house and worshipped. Then he went home and asked for food. They placed food in front of him, and he ate. His officials asked him, Why are you acting this way? You fasted and cried over the child when he was alive, but as soon as the child died, you got up and ate. David answered, As long as the child was alive, I fasted and cried. I thought, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But why should I fast now that he's dead? Can I bring him back? Some day I'll go to him, but he won't come back to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba. He went to bed with her and she later gave birth to a son. David named him Solomon. The Lord loved the child and sent a message through the prophet Nathan to name the baby Jedidiah, the Lord's beloved. Meanwhile, Joab fought against the Ammonite city of Rabbah and captured its royal fortress. So he sent the messengers to tell David, I fought against Rabbah and captured the fortress guarding its water supply. Gather the rest of the troops, surround the city, and capture it. Otherwise, I will capture the city, and it will be named after me. So David gathered all the troops and went to Rabbah. He fought against the city and captured it. He took the gold crown from the head of Rabbah's king and put it on his own head. The crown weighed 75 pounds and contained a precious stone. David also took a lot of goods from the city. He brought out the troops who were there and put them to work with saws, hoes and axes. He did the same to all the Ammonite cities. Then David and all the troops returned to Jerusalem. Forgiveness is God's extraordinary gift of grace, the result of the multitude of your tender mercies, as it's said in Psalm 51 verse 1. King David's appeal to God to deal with him not in accordance with what his sin deserves. In Psalm 103 verse 10, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. But... In accordance with his divine character, namely his mercy, faithfulness and compassion, as we read in 51 verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And Exodus chapter 34 verses 6 and 7, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Read Psalm 51, verses 6 to 19. How is forgiveness of sin portrayed here? What is the goal of divine forgiveness? Psalm 51, beginning with verse 6. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, 
and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Divine forgiveness involves more than a legal proclamation of innocence. It produces a profound change that reaches the most inner parts of human self. As we read in Psalm 51 and verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. And we also see this in Hebrews 4 verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It brings about a new creation. As you read in Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And John 3 verses 3 to 8, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of Spirit is Spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, Ye must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Hebrew word bara, B-A-R-A, translated create, depicts divine creative power, as we read in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Only God can barra, only God can produce a radical and lasting change in the repentant person's heart, as you read in Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. And from the God's Word translation I read, We are his servants because the same God who said that light should shine out of darkness has given us light. For that reason, we bring to light the knowledge about God's glory, which shines from Christ's face. David asked for cleansing with hyssop in Leviticus 14, 2 to 8 and Psalm 51, verse 7. Let's look at those verses. Leviticus 14, 2 to 8. This shall be the law of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water, and he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose in the open field." He who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, and wash himself in water that he may be clean. After that, he shall come into the camp and shall stay outside his tent seven days. 
and Psalm 51 and verse 7. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. He feels that his guilt keeps him banned from the Lord's presence in the same way as the leper is banned from the community while the state of uncleanness lasts. As we read in Psalm 51.11, Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He fears that sacrifices cannot restore him fully because there was no sacrifice that could atone for his premeditated sins of adultery and murder. As you read in Exodus 21.14, But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbour to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. And Leviticus 20 and verse 10, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Only unconditional divine grace could accept David's broken and contrite heart as a sacrifice and restore David back into harmony with God, as we read in Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. By asking for cleansing with hyssop, he wants to return to God's presence. And so to finish the day, if God can forgive David for adultery, deception and murder, what hope exists for you? Tuesday, February 13, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities. Read Psalm 130. How are the gravity of sin and hope for sinners portrayed? Psalm 130, beginning at verse 1. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The psalmist's great affliction is related to his own and his people's sins, as we saw in verse 3. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand in verse 8, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The people's sins are so grave that they threaten to separate the people from God forever. Scripture speaks of the records of sins that are being kept for the judgment day. We read that in Daniel 7 verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, a thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, the court was seated and the books were opened. And Revelation 20 verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books and of sinners' names being removed from the book of life. As you read in Exodus 32, 32, Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. And Psalm 69 and verse 28, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. And Revelation 13 and verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
The psalmist thus appeals to God's forgiveness, which will eradicate the record of sin. As we read in Revelation 51, verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. And verse 9, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. And then Jeremiah 31 and verse 34. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And Micah chapter 7 verse 19. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. He knows, as Hans K. La Rondelle writes in Deliverance in the Psalms, page 180 and 182, that God is not angry by nature. His love is everlasting. His anger is aroused only by man's failure to appreciate his love. The purpose of his anger is not to wound, but rather to heal man, not to destroy, but to save his covenant people. End of quote. Remarkably, it is God's readiness to forgive sins and not to punish them that inspires reverence of God. As you read in Psalm 130 verse 4, But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. In Romans 2 and verse 4, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Genuine worship is built on admiration of God's character of love, not on fear of punishment. God's children are called to wait on the Lord in Psalm 27 and verse 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And Psalm 37 verse 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. The Hebrew word kawa, Q-A-W-A-H, or wait, literally means to stretch, and is the root of the Hebrew word for hope. Thus, Waiting for the Lord is not a passive surrender to miserable circumstances, but rather a hopeful stretching or eager anticipation of the Lord's intervention. The psalmist's hope is grounded not in his personal optimism, but in God's word, as we read in Psalm 130 verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. Faithful waiting on the Lord is not in vain because after the dark night, the morning of divine deliverance comes. See how the psalmist's personal plea becomes that of the entire community in verses 7 and 8. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their iniquities. The individual's well-being is inseparable from that of the whole people. Thus, one prays not only for himself, but for the community. As believers, we are part of a community, and what impacts one part of the community impacts everyone. And so to finish today, think about the question, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Psalm 130, verse 3. What does that mean to you personally? Where would you be if the Lord marked your iniquities? Wednesday, February 14, Praise to the Majestic and Merciful God. Read Psalms 113 and Psalms 123. What two different aspects of God's character are depicted in the Psalms? First of all, Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. 
Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who dwells on high? Who humbles himself to behold? the things that are in the heavens and in the earth. He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. He grants the barren woman a home like a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. And Psalm 123. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease, with the contempt of the proud. Psalms 113 and 123 praise both the majesty and mercy of the Lord. The Lord's majesty is revealed in the greatness of his name and in the exalted place of his throne, which is above all nations and above the heavens, as you read in Psalm 113, verses, verse 4 and 5. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who dwells on high? And Psalm 123, verse 1. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Psalm 113, verse 5, is a statement of faith that no power within or outside of the world can challenge the God of Israel. The unapproachable heights where the Lord dwells are illustrated through the fact that the Lord is willing to humble himself or stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. Psalm 113 verse 6. God's abiding on high does not prevent him from seeing what is occurring here below. The Lord's mercy is manifested in his gracious readiness to be involved with the world and to save the needy and poor from their troubles. His generous hand is obviously not hidden from his servants, though his dwelling place is in the distant heavens. God's greatness and care, which cannot be fully discerned in God's amazing transcendence, becomes explicit in God's deeds of mercy and compassion. The needy, the poor and the oppressed might experience firsthand God's sovereign power in the remarkable reversals that he can perform in their favour. The exalted God manifests his greatness by using his power to exalt the downcast. The people are free to approach the Lord because his sovereign majesty and supremacy do not change the fact that he is their gracious creator and sustainer and that the people are his servants, his beloved children. Worship is thus motivated not only by God's magnificent, but also by his goodness. Praise is not limited to time and space. God's greatness and mercy are best manifested in Jesus Christ, who was willing to stoop down from heaven and be brought as low as death on the cross in order to lift up fallen humanity. In my favourite passage, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Here in the cross, we have the greatest reasons possible to worship and praise God for what he has done for us. And so to finish today, 
Dwell on the cross and what happened there for you personally. What has Jesus saved you from? Why is it so important to keep the cross foremost in your mind? Thursday, February 15. Forget not all his benefits. Read Psalm 103. How is God's mercy portrayed here? Psalm 103, beginning at verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For... As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Psalm 103 enumerates the Lord's manifold blessings. The blessings include all his benefits in verse 2 for a flourishing life in verses 3 to 6. These blessings are grounded in God's gracious character and in his faithfulness to his covenant with Israel as expressed in verses 7 to 18. The Lord remembers human frailty and transience and has compassion on his people in verses 13 to 17. Remembering is more than mere cognitive activity. It involves a commitment that is expressed in action. God delivers and sustains his people in verses 3 to 13. The powerful images in Psalm 103, 11 to 16 illustrate the immeasurable greatness of God's grace, which can be compared only to the infinite vastness of the heavens, as you read in Isaiah 55, verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. How then should people respond to God's loving kindness? First, by blessing the Lord, as we read in verses 1 and 2. Blessing is generally understood as an act of bestowing material and spiritual benefits upon someone, as we read in Genesis 49 verse 25, by the God of your Father who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you, with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. And Psalm 5 verse 11, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favour, you will surround him as with a shield. Because God is the source of all blessings, how can human beings bless God? 
An inferior can bless a superior as a means of thanking or praising him. As we read in 1 Kings 8.66, On the eighth day he sent the people away and they blessed the king and went to their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David and for Israel, his people, and Job 29 verse 13, the blessing of a perishing man came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. God blesses people by conferring good on them, and people bless God by praising the good in him, that is, by revering him for his gracious character. Second, by remembering all his benefits and his covenant, as we read in verse 2 and verses 18 to 22, just as the Lord remembers the feeble human condition and his covenant with his people in verses 3 to 13. Remembering is a crucial aspect of the relationship between God and his people. Just as God remembers his promises to the people, so the people are indebted to remember God's faithfulness and respond to him with love and obedience. With this idea in mind, these famous words of Ellen G. White are so appropriate. From Desire of Ages, page 83. It would be well for all to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant. Our love will be quickened and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. End of quote. Friday, February 16. Further thought. We are recommended to read that amazing chapter in the book Steps to Christ titled The Sinner's Need of Christ, pages 17 to 22 if you have a copy at home or online. In the Psalms, the voices of God's people join as one in repeating the chorus, His mercy endures forever in celebration of God's eternal love. And uh, there are so many verses. Psalm 106, verse 1, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And Psalm 107, verse 1, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And Psalm 118, verses 1 to 4, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercy endures forever. And verse 29, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Ever. And Psalm 136, and that has 26 verses, which we will read right now. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth, above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. To him who struck Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endures forever. And brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endures forever. With a strong hand, 
and with an outstretched arm, for his mercy endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his mercy endures forever, and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, for his mercy endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his mercy endures forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his mercy endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage, for his mercy endures forever. A heritage to Israel his servant, for his mercy endures forever, who remembered us in our lowly state, for his mercy endures forever, and rescued us from our enemies, for his mercy endures forever, who gave food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. O give thanks to the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. Not to praise God, Hans La Rundel writes in Deliverance in the Psalms, page 178, would mean to forget all his benefits, not to appreciate God's gifts. Only those who praise do not forget. Thinking and speaking about God is not yet praising him. Praise begins when one acknowledges God's majesty and works and responds with adoration of his goodness mercy and wisdom, end of quote. The significance of the solemn confession of God's enduring mercy gains even deeper significance when we remember that God's chesed, K-H-E-S-E-D, namely his covenantal loving kindness and faithfulness, stands firm and unchanging amid human sin and rebellion against God. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 148, we read, We have sinned against him and are undeserving of his favour, yet he himself has put into our lips that most wonderful of pleas. Do not abhor us for thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Remember, break not thy covenant with us, Jeremiah 14, 21. When we come to him confessing our unworthiness and sin, He has pledged himself to give heed to our cry. The honour of his throne is staked for the fulfilment of his word unto us. End of quote. Experiencing God's graciousness to him in Psalm 103 verse 2 encourages the psalmist to say that the Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed in verse 6. Verse 2 read, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Thus, the final aim of the psalmist's personal testimony and praise of God's mercy in his life is to reassure others of God's loving kindness so that they, too, can open their hearts to God and receive his saving grace and praise God. As you read in Psalm 9, verses 11 and 12, Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds among the people. When he avenges blood, he remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. And Psalm 22, verses 22 to 27, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him, but when he cried to him, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. And finally, Psalm 66 verse 16. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. 
And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, what are the practical implications of the fact that God's mercy is everlasting for the people's salvation? Why does this not mean that one can continue sinning because God's mercy is forever? Two, how do we reconcile God's forgiveness of our sins with the idea of God's judgment on sin? And three, how do the expressions of God's mercy in the New Testament fit with those in the Psalms? And so we read several passages, Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. For God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And 1 Timothy 1, 16. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me, first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. And Titus 3 verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then in Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16, we read, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy to find grace to help in time of need. And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Burden is Lifted, Part 3, by Andrew McChesney. On a Friday evening, Sekulo was waiting outside the boys' dormitory at his high school in Sarajevo, capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina. He was waiting for a boy who had insulted him, and he planned to beat him up. As he waited, a friend offered him cognac. He drank and after many more drinks passed out in a drunken stupor. In the morning he knew that his friends would tease him mercilessly for not getting revenge. He decided to hide for the day. But where? And then he remembered the invitation from his Adventist teacher to go to church. It was Sabbath morning. Sekule's hair was long and greasy. He hadn't washed it for a month. His breath reeked, but he went to church. When he arrived, he looked carefully for a place to sit. He had heard that Adventists celebrated Sweet Sabbath orgies every week and he didn't want to be found sitting next to a grandmother. Spotting an attractive young woman, he sat down near her. When the church pastor began to preach, Sekule's mouth dropped open in surprise. The pastor was giving Bible answers to his questions about God and hell. A huge burden was lifted from his heart as he heard that God indeed is love. In 1 John 4, 8, he desires to save every sinner in Luke 19, 10, and will cast no one into an eternal hell, Malachi 4, 1 and 3 and Psalm 37, verses 10 and 11. After the sermon, someone invited Sekule to evangelistic meetings, and he went. At the end of the meetings, he asked the church pastor, Tell me, please, what am I allowed to do and what am I not allowed to do? Well, you can do whatever you want, the pastor said. Don't talk that way, Sekula said. Tell me what I can and cannot do. You cannot work on Sabbath anymore, the pastor said. Okay, done. You cannot go to school on Sabbath anymore. Okay, done. You cannot fight anymore. Oh, okay, done. You cannot eat unclean meat. Okay, I won't eat unclean meat. Actually, we suggest that you not eat meat at all. Okay, I won't eat meat anymore. From that day, Sekula never worked or went to school on Sabbath. He never fought and he never ate meat. He was baptised six months later at the age of 18. But he accepted Adventist teachings on the spot, all because his questions of God and hell had been answered from the Bible. Sekuli Sekulis is an affluent entrepreneur and faithful Seventh-day Adventist church in Montenegro. Read more of his story next week. 